Okay, well, our text is relatively brief this morning, but it is rather full. And it is, um, again, as I've told you, Paul is reminding us that we have an obligation not just to keep the fifth commandment, because that's really what he was applying in the previous uh, passage we were looking at with regard to the government. But we have to keep the others as well, which is simply a way of saying we need to love all mankind. We need to love our neighbor, wherever our neighbor might be. So let me read the, the passage, and then we'll just briefly review and um, get into this, to this passage, get into what it is that um, we're being called to here. And remember, though this is beyond our ability to do, it's not beyond the Lord's ability to work within us. So, so Paul says, beginning in verse 8 of Romans 13, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, one, one obvious point here is, is that um, this is the definition of love. Okay, keeping the commandments is not legalism, you know. Um, you're trying to save yourself by your works. We should just chuck these things away because Christ has done it all. I don't really need to do anything. No, Jesus here is teaching us what it means to love. Yeah, that's, that's what it's all about. This is what he did. This is the way he loved. So with that in mind, let's remember, first of all, what we were looking at last time. And that is Paul gave us at least three reasons why we should submit to our government. And again, that's something that's becoming increasingly difficult to do because of the way our government is going. But we do have an obligation to our government. And first of all, Paul said, because, and remember, the government Paul was talking about was Caesar and the Roman authorities, okay? So do we have anything to complain about? Anyway, so first of all, because God is the one who established this authority, Paul says if we disobey the government, we're really disobeying God, except in those cases where they go against his express will. Okay, then we do need to disobey it. But because God ordained it and tells us to submit to it, Paul says we need to submit to it for conscience sake. This is part of our service to God and, again, part of what it means to love our neighbor. Now, secondly, he said we should submit to it because God established it for us. Okay, it's for our good, his servant to us, for our good. We saw last time that as bad as our government actually is or currently is, it's better than having nothing. Because if we had nothing, we'd have anarchy. Imagine living in a society where anyone who is stronger than you could take anything from you at any time, could even take your, your wife or your children. I mean, there have been situations where that has happened in history because there was no protection. So government is, is good. Now God in his mercy established this authority to prevent that from happening. It's a way of protecting our lives and preserving society so that he can preserve his church, so that the church can do his work. That's what government is all about. And because God intends it for good, we should submit to it. Thirdly, we should submit to it because of the consequences of not doing that. God has given, us, has given to, to the governor and to, uh, the magistrate the power of the sword, hasn't he? The power to punish, the power to execute. And he gave it to them to encourage good behavior and to punish evil. Now, Paul told us that if we don't obey them, then we can expect retribution. If we break the law, we should expect punishment. Now, this is also one of the reasons why God tells us, remember um, what happened at the end of chapter 12, you know, don't take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink and so forth. This is one of the reasons why God tells us not to seek revenge because he is appointed an avenger. That's what he tells us in the beginning of chapter 13 that we looked at before. So we are to step aside so that the government can deal with it. And in those instances where they do not deal with these situations justly, we do need to believe God will still deal with them. 
in one way or the other. He's either going to bring them to repentance and save them, in which case Christ will have died for them on the cross, or he's going to exact justice against them. Now, Paul also said because our government leaders are working for him that we need to support them through taxes. Yes, nobody likes to hear about taxes, but we need to pay taxes because magistrates, those who rule and govern for our good to protect us, they devote their full time to it, and what they do doesn't actually generate income, so they have no means of supporting themselves outside of taxes being paid. And we may not like it, but they need the support of those whom they govern. So Paul told us we need to pay all the different types of taxes that they require, and Jesus showed us by way of example that we need to do this even when the taxation is unjust, even when the taxes aren't owed, so that we don't give offense. Now, this morning, Paul tells us about another debt that we owe, one that flows out of the previous one, something that we owe to everyone because what we saw before is under the same rubric, and that is our obligation to love our neighbor, to love everyone. Now, I want us to consider, <clears throat> first of all, why we should pay this debt, and it's implied by what Paul says here. The most obvious reason, if I were to ask you, why should we pay this debt, the answer should be because God commands it, okay? Whatever God commands, we need to obey it because He is the Lord and because we love Him. Now, I'm sure you recognize this list that um, I've already told you what it is, but you would have recognized it anyway. It's, it's the, Paul is, is quoting the last six of the Ten Commandments, although he really quotes only five of them. Now, this is the standard that God has always required of us from the time of creation, right? This is the law that he wrote on Adam's heart, Adam and Eve's, when he made them. I mean, think about if, if man hadn't fallen and the family grew, if these commandments were broken, what would that look like? What would happen? Uh, it would be, well, not only offensive to God and bring down his wrath, but um, it, it would have been injurious to, to our neighbor. These are things that have to be kept because we're human beings. We owe God our love and worship. We owe one another this love. So this is the law that he wrote on Adam's heart, and it would have continued to have been the standard if Adam had obeyed and we grew up in the Garden of Eden, which he would have. It's just that that garden would have continued to get bigger and bigger, you see. It would have filled the earth as we're multiplying and subduing the earth or fulfilling the cultural mandate. Uh, this would have been the standard all along because this is a law we could never have broken in any respect. We would never want to because of our love for him. And Paul already told us in Romans chapter 2, this is the law that remains written on man's heart even after the fall. You know, just a shadowy version of it, but it's still there. That's why man's conscience convicts him when he does something that's wrong. So we need to keep it because this is God's will. This is plan. This is the standard of, for us. And this is what it means to love him and our neighbor, which has always been his will. Now, second reason we need to keep them is because they are good. You know, God has the right to define what love is because he is holy and he is just and he is good. And he never requires anything other than what is perfectly consistent with his character. He commands us to do what he loves what he delights in. And having his spirit, this is what we delight in as well. So we want to keep these commandments, okay? Thirdly, we should obey them because this is certainly what we owe him. Now, we saw that at Christmas time, remember? The gift that God gave to us, the gift of Christ. It may not have been at that time of the year, but there's no doubt that he gave Jesus to us. And that means that God, we, we owe a debt to him not only because he created us, but because he redeemed us, because he's get, not only because he's given to us everything that we've ever needed to live from the, you know, not only making us and providing for us from the time we entered into this world until the present, but the fact that he has given to us that which was most precious to him, remembering that God could have let us all perish, he gave the one who was most precious to him, the one whom he loved the most, his son, the Lord Jesus. 
And Jesus gave his love. He, his love is so great that he gave himself for us, his life, that we might be reconciled with God. And the Father and the Son gave us the Holy Spirit so that we would want to be reconciled to him. Okay? And they did all of this while we hated them, while we were still their enemies. You know, it wasn't because God saw a spark of goodness in us, some desire for him, that he did these things for us, but moved with utter compassion for people completely dead and lost in their sins. He gave that which is most precious to him. So all that to say is we owe a debt, don't we? A debt that we could never repay. But we can pay the debt that he puts us under, and that debt is a debt of thankfulness. And we show our thankfulness by loving our neighbor in this way. Now, we should do this, fourthly, because of who it is we're called to love. Let's not forget who man is. Man is the image of God. This, this is the way we should understand it. You know, we are not to make images of God, but, but God has actually made an image of himself, and that is man. Okay? So we are in the image of God, and that's true even after the fall. The fall wiped away our moral likeness to God. We no longer love what God loves. But even without that, we are still called the image of God. That, uh, remember the penalty that God said after the, the flood and after Noah gets off the ark and he says, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed because in the image of God he made man. And he was talking about man after the fall. It's a terrible crime to destroy the image of God. And that's why there's capital punishment for cap the capital crime of murdering the image of God. So we're still like him, like I said, in many ways. We still reflect his, his image, even fallen. We're still personal. We still have intelligence. We still have imagination and purposefulness. We still are moral creatures, which none of the other created beings are except for the angels. So we have the capacity to, be, to, to make moral choices, and that way we reflect God's image. So again, that's why it's a serious crime to take away human life. And let me just mention, that applies to no matter how old you are or how young you are. Okay? Abortion is destroying God's image. Um, euthanasia is destroying God's image. That we are bound not to do because, again, man is in the image of God. And then one that John Owen brought up that I had hadn't thought of as, as perhaps as intimately as this, but we are to love our neighbor because our neighbor is our brother or our sister, right? I mean, we are all of one race, the human race. We don't think about that person living next door as a family member, unless, of course, they actually are a family member. We usually think of them, or we should think of them, as cousins. But as we, you know, look at one another, we're all so different looking, right? We, we seem like we come from all different backgrounds, but, you know, we all come from one set of parents. And even that was narrowed down through Noah and his family. So we all come from Noah and his family. I think most of us here, if not all of us, would come from uh, Japheth, right? Um, so we're all cousins. And for that reason, we should love each other. All right, so for all these reasons, we're obligated to do this. So secondly, let's think about this debt, okay? And one very obvious point, I've already made it, is to whom we are to pay this debt. Let me just say, Paul says anyone. He says pay it to one another. He says pay it to our neighbor. Uh, all these are in, in the text we're looking at. And if we ask the question, who really is my neighbor? <laughs> you know, the, the scribe asked the question because he wanted to pat himself on the back thinking that he had done it. But uh, Jesus was telling him, no, it's everyone, everyone that's in need. And suddenly he's knocked down several notches. But who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus answered that question in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Instead of just simply saying, everyone's your neighbor, uh, because that's what the word means. The word neighbor means anyone who is close to us. He showed us what a good neighbor does. A good neighbor helps those who are near him in need, and my neighbor that I need to love is the one who is near me who is in need. And that's true even if the person is your enemy. <laughs> you know, you still need to help them. 
you still need to show them compassion and, and mercy, no matter how much they've offended you. Okay, so with that in mind, how are we to love our neighbor? Well, God outlines this for us in the six, six of the Ten Commandments. Let's just take them in the order Paul gives them. First of all, he says we're to love them by not committing adultery. Now, we know committing adultery, that means having relations with somebody who is, you're not married to outside of the marriage covenant. Now, the problem is the Jews understood this merely as not having physical relations with someone other than your spouse. And that is true as far as it goes. But it also means we're not to think about it, okay? not to fantasize about it, not to desire it in our hearts, not even to talk about it, not to flirt you know, with others, but to be faithful, be faithful in our hearts and our minds to our spouses. And, of course, it means helping others to be faithful to their, to their covenant as well. And by the way, this by way of extension also applies, applies to not having physical relationships outside of marriage. If you happen not to be married as well, you know, uh, sexual relations, if you're not married, um, if you don't have a spouse, it's not with them. That's sin, either adultery or fornication, okay? And that is damaging. That is hating, the Lord says, loving is protecting that marriage covenant and protecting that purity. And that's how we love our neighbor. Now, secondly, we're to love them by not murdering them. And again, the Jews thought that just meant taking away their lives, and certainly that is that is a, an application of this. But we need to understand that there are other ways this applies, you know. By the way, I should mention we're not to murder them unjustly. And if you murder them, that wouldn't be unjust. If you kill them, an unjust killing is a murder, okay? But a just killing, that's something that is possible. And that happens if they try to take away your life, if they're coming at you with some weapon and in, you can see their intent is to kill you. If you have a weapon in your hands, you can use it to stop them. Or if they're threatening somebody else that, that is with you. We don't like the idea. Hopefully, we'll never be in that situation. But we are, we are allowed to do that. But we are not to try to take somebody else's life away, okay? We're not even to hurt them. We're not to think about hurting them. They're not, we're not to want to hurt them or desire to hurt them. We're not to say hurtful things to them. You know, uh, the, the Lord did say if we say to somebody, you empty-headed, good-for-nothing, you know, and from the heart and mean that, we've broken that commandment. And he says, you're guilty enough to go into the fiery hell for doing that. We're not to hate our neighbor, what are we supposed to do to love them? Well, not to injure them, of course, but we are to protect them. Paul's already told us if they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them a drink. If they're naked, clothe them. If they don't have shelter, shelter them or find shelter for them if they are exposed. Now, think about this. If we are to protect them from harm, from danger, from things that might injure them, how much more should we try to protect them from the greatest danger that they are in? And that is, of course, damnation, the destruction of their souls forever in hell. That's another, another obligation that we're under, the obligation of love that comes from the Sixth Commandment. Um, and we can only do that, of course, by being good witnesses, you know, reflecting the image of Jesus and sharing the gospel with, with them. Now, third, he says we are to love them by not stealing from them, by not taking away something from them that doesn't belong to us but belongs to them. We are to respect what is theirs and protect what belongs to them. And by the way, that, that could apply to many different things. It could apply to time and reputation. It could apply to just taking things we don't think are worth very much but still belong to maybe our employer. We shouldn't be taking, you know, uh, consumables, uh, office supplies, those types of things, but especially though those things that we know are the property of our neighbor, right? Uh, I remember um, how I felt when somebody stole my car. I don't know if you ever had your car stolen or had your property taken away. <laughs> it was parked outside of the pastor's house, you know, and, uh, you know, we had had our service in a local park because the Seventh-day Adventist church that we were renting were having their 
uh, I hate to say it, the Revelation Seminar, they're totally off base as far as what, what that means. And they were actually having that meeting on a Sunday because for them, Sunday is not the Sabbath. It's the seventh day of the week. It's, it's the Saturday. So anyway, we couldn't meet there, so we met in the park, and afterwards we went to the pastor's house, and we were fellowshipping, and the worship leader was there, and actually I had led worship that, that day in the park, and he wanted to teach me, you know, something. I wanted to learn it, grab my guitar out of the car, but then we went to leave. The car was gone. <laughs> car was gone, and the car was eventually recovered. You know, it, there were other things in there. I had a portable amplifier that I really liked, and I had a chorus pedal, some cables, my Bibles were in there. I had two of them on that particular occasion. The in-dash, you know, cassette player, that was gone. The car was recovered, but these things were not. However, the Bibles were there. They left the Bibles. And those were the things I wanted back the most out of everything that was taken. But the point is, when I saw the car was gone, first of all, I was like, I thought I parked it here. <laughs> but after I realized it was gone, it was just the sense of violation you know, that somebody took something that wasn't theirs, didn't belong to them. And just, just the, the inconvenience and the work and the cost and all these things that were entailed in it, it it's, I did not feel loved, <laughs> okay? I felt unloved. I felt, uh, I felt hated because what they did was just purely self-centered and unjust and unloving. And our Lord doesn't want us to do that to other people. Now, Paul tells us, fourth, not even to want what other people have, because that's what leads to stealing. But, but again, protect what God has given to them and protect, it, protect what they have in our hearts because, so that we don't desire what they have. And at the same time, that commandment tells us to be content with what the Lord has actually given to us. How do we keep from coveting? It's just to be happy with what the Lord has given to us. And, you know, if we're living, breathing, and... You know, we're, we're surviving. We, we have what we need. You know, so we don't, need to, we don't need to worry about it. Paul did say, if I have food and covering, actually, Jesus said that, be content with that. Paul said he learned to be content in whatever circumstance he was because he didn't need very much. He had what was most important to him at all times, and that was his relationship with the Lord. Now, let me just note, Paul doesn't mention the other six commandments here. He doesn't mention the four, the first four, because he's talking about our obligation to love our neighbor, which I think is an extension of our obligation to love the government, or not to love them, but to, to submit to them, right? We do need to love them, love them by submitting to them. It's an application of the fifth commandment. When the Lord says, you shall honor your father and your mother, the Westminster Assembly in their catechism points out that God in Scripture calls kings fathers, even nursing mothers. And prophets are also called fathers. So this term father and mother applies not only to our father and mother, uh, you know, the ones that gave us birth, but it applies to all authority. So Paul has been talking about the fifth commandment. And having applied that, he just comes over then and applies the rest of them. So he's focusing, though, on our debt to our neighbor and that's why he doesn't focus on the first four, but I think we should do that, and we're going to do that uh, this evening. But there are two that he doesn't mention, actually one he doesn't mention, and I think it's because the Roman believers understood them. Let's not, re you know, let's not forget who they are. The, the church was founded by Jewish converts on, on the day of Pentecost, and the Jews were well, you know, well steeped in the Ten Commandments. To make, it, to make his point, Paul just really only needed to mention a few, and that's what he's doing here, just to make his point. And, you know, we have a name for that. It's called synecdoche, when you use a part for the whole. That's what he's doing here. He's giving a part, but he really means the whole. And he says, if there are any others besides these that I've mentioned, and he knows there are others. He didn't, you know, he's not saying if there are, but since there are. They're all summarized in the second greatest commandment. You know, um, and we'll look at that just briefly in a moment. But again, considering the other two, we also need to love our neighbor by not bearing false witness against them. Okay, and what that means is we're not to accuse them falsely, charging them with crimes that they actually haven't done, simply to get them into trouble. I mean, that's using the government 
as your executioner or your avenger to take, basically bring retribution on this person who hasn't actually committed that crime. You see, you see what you're doing there if you do that, especially if you're making it in a court of law. That's exactly what, um, remember um, Ahab wanted Nabal's vineyard and he couldn't have it because Nabal didn't want to sell it, so he's crying and Jezebel sees him and why are you so downcast and he explains it. She says, oh, I'll fix the problem, so she hires a couple of false witnesses to falsely accuse him and they take Nabal out and put him to death. He was innocent. And then when Ahab goes out into the garden or into this vineyard and he's all happy because it's now his, uh, prophet comes to him and says, you're going to die because of that. Okay? There's, there's a consequence for that. Whatever it is that you try to falsely accuse somebody of, whatever the penalty is for that crime, that's the penalty that will be applied to you. You see, that's justice. But the Lord says, don't do that because that's not a loving thing to do. Don't, don't even say things that are true about them if you're only saying them to get them into trouble, exposing their weaknesses or something like that. We are to protect them, love our neighbor, protect their reputations, not destroy them. And then, of course, we are to love our neighbor by honoring authority, fathers and mothers. And this applies to all authority to listen carefully and weigh what it is they have to say. That's what honor means, weight. It means to weigh what they're saying, to take it into account. If they're no longer alive, such as our parents may be, then what they said while they were alive, we need to honor that if it's something we should honor. And we should submit to it as long as it doesn't contradict the Scripture. Remember the Bible, God's will always trumps all other authority. Now, if this is too much to remember, Paul gives us a quick rule of thumb. Just love your neighbor in the way you love yourself. Okay. Jesus said it another way. He says, however you want others to treat you, so treat them. For this is the law and the prophets. Okay, now, that is a summary. And that may be a quick way to figure out how to do this. However, I think we need to modify this a little bit. Modify what Jesus said? Why would I do that? Well, we need to do that because of the culture that we're in. Now, remember, Sinclair Ferguson... He stated this another way, and at first I was a little bit offended. I'm thinking, you're, you're putting words into Jesus' mouth. You shouldn't do that. As one of my professors in college said, that's not sanitary. Okay, no. <laughs> you remember that. Okay. We don't want to tell Jesus what to tell us, but Sinclair Ferguson pointed out something, and we need to pay attention to it, particularly because of today's moral climate, what people are like today and how they might interpret that commandment. I should treat somebody else the way I want them to treat me? Well, you can think about how that might work out in an unregenerate's mind, okay? This is what Ferguson says. We should love our neighbors as Jesus loved his neighbor, okay? Now that, how can you argue with that? And that's really what Jesus had in mind, isn't it, okay? Love others according to the example that he is giving to us. So let's close by just considering, again, some of the things that Jesus did. Jesus treated his parents and all authority with the utmost respect and honor, not only when he was a child, but also as an adult, even on the cross when, he, when, he's, when he's dying, and he realizes he's not going to be able to provide for his mother any longer. He honored his mother, his dad presumably being gone, when he told John, look, this is your mother, okay? I want you to take her and I want you to care for her as your own mother. And same with Mary, behold your son. Okay, so there was a, this obligation that he had to love his parents, Jesus was still doing that, even to his dying breath. Jesus protected life wherever he went. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He freed those who were being held captive by the devil. He defended his disciples when the, when the soldiers came out to arrest him. Even during their earthly ministry, do you know, just, just from what the... Remember when, when Jesus said something to Judas and Judas went out and did it and the rest of the disciples thought Jesus was telling him to take some of the money out of the money bag and give to the poor. That tells us that during their earthly ministry, 
even though they had limited resources, just the bag, that, and it was even lighter because of Judas pilfering from it, but they would take some of the money they had and they would regularly give it to the poor. Jesus was protecting life. He was loving his neighbor. He even protected life by restoring life to the dead. He raised the, you know, the, the, the widow of Nain, her son, and of course, Lazarus from the dead. He was absolutely pure in his desires and his thoughts and his actions and his words. He respected and honored every woman that he met. He never took anything that didn't belong to him. Never falsely accused anyone of anything. Never coveted anything anyone had, but was perfectly content with what his father had provided. And again, instead of holding on to the excess that he had, you know, from the money bag. And by the way, they were dependent on the contributions of some wealthy women who were supporting his ministry. So the money went into the bag, but he regularly gave out of that, out of that money, even out of their poverty. All they had were the clothes on their back, the staff in their hand, and not much. Their meals were provided on a daily basis by those that benefited from their ministry, perhaps, or maybe Jesus was providing the food. He certainly did on occasion. But the point is, Jesus paid this debt of love that he owed to all of his neighbors. Think about the scriptures and what you read about Jesus. Do you, can you think of one instance where somebody came to him asking for help and he turned them away? No, I'm not going to help you. Now, there was one where he tested faith. It's not good to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Or, okay. But when she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the table. And he said, woman, because of that saying, because of your faith, let it be done to your daughters, you said. And he healed her. Okay? Jesus never turned anyone away. And he gave to everyone who asked of him. He even gave his life to us to, to save us. Now, we need to remember that Jesus did these things not just to save us, and we, and we thank God that he did. We thank the Lord. But he also did this to give us an example of what God means when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, and what it means to keep these commandments, what it means to be like him, what it means to be a man or a woman or a child of God. It means to follow that example that Jesus gave us. And let's not forget, he doesn't leave us on his own to do this. He's given us power to do this by sending his Holy Spirit who writes the law on our hearts by giving us really a love for the commandments. That's really what that means. Uh, that's why it's important for us at all times to be filled with the Spirit of God as the Spirit continually shows us what would Jesus do in any circumstance and we, we know that through the Scripture as he shows us just how where do I, how, what word do I use? How agreeable it is? How good it is? What a wonderful example it is? I mean, again, we, we noted before, this is what we love about Jesus, isn't it? His loving, merciful, gracious heart towards others. Well, as the Spirit shows us that, then, as, as we're reminded again from 2 Corinthians 3.18, we see that. And the Spirit is saying, that's what I want you to do. That's what I want you to be like. So, he gives us that sight, that understanding. He gives us that desire. And then we yield to it. We, we go the direction he's calling us to go. That's really what it means to be led by the Spirit. So again, Jesus is the example. The Spirit shows us that example and shows us how, how beautiful that is. And what we need to do is we need to yield to it. Yeah? In any given circumstance, we just have two things. As Edwards put it, my duty and my sin. Well, what is his duty? It's what the Spirit of God is showing me. Christ would do. That's my duty. What's sin? What my flesh wants to do. In every decision we have to make, we have these two principles. One saying go this way, the other one saying go this way. Well, we need to go the direction the Spirit is telling us, the direction Jesus would go, okay? And that is how the law of God is fulfilled in us according to Romans 8 by following the Spirit's guidance and yielding to Him instead of to our flesh. So we need to be filled with the Spirit and listen to Him as He speaks to us through His Word. 
Now this evening we're going to consider again that other debt that we owe, the, the debt of love that we loved or that we owe towards God. So at this point, let's go ahead and uh, bow and let's ask the Lord to um, apply the things that we've heard, to remember the things we've heard, to remember the summary, you know, let's love others the way that Jesus loves them and, and for the grace to be able to do that because that's what honors the one whom we love most of all. And as we do that, uh, and as we repent of things where we have failed, let's use this to prepare to come to the table. Let's pray.